Welcome everyone, my name is Blaine and I'd like to welcome you to New Hope Windward. Thank you for joining us today, we're so glad that you're here. In a few moments, we're going to hear a great message. But before we do, we're going to worship God through our giving. As the war in Ukraine rages on, there have been hundreds of civilian deaths and injuries caused by the shelling of Ukrainian cities and homes by invading Russian forces. The war has resulted in a catastrophic humanitarian crisis, with over 1.5 million Ukrainian civilians and children displaced by the war seeking refuge and safety in neighboring countries. And despite being unarmed, Ukrainian refugees attempting to flee their country have been shot at and bombed by the Russian military, adding to the escalating death toll. Yet at the risk of their lives, millions of Ukrainians have chosen to remain behind to defend both their country and freedom against advancing Russian forces. In Ukraine, there are currently 32 Foursquare churches, a ministry training center, drug and alcohol rehab centers, and several orphanages, all led and operated by the Foursquare Church and praying for an end to the conflict. As we stand behind and pray for Ukraine, humanitarian relief efforts by European nations and nonprofit organizations have been underway, including Foursquare Disaster Relief. Foursquare churches throughout Europe have sent emergency food, personal hygiene supplies, and other life-saving essentials to the many remaining to defend their homeland. In 1 Timothy 6, 18 to 19, the Apostle Paul instructed Timothy to encourage the church to give generously towards those struggling and in need. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. As a Foursquare Church, we want to do everything we can to provide emergency aid to the many suffering in Ukraine. Every month, we give thousands of dollars to Foursquare Disaster Relief so that they can quickly distribute much-needed emergency relief to disaster-stricken areas like Ukraine. Thank you, New Hope Windward, for your incredibly compassionate and generous hearts to meet the dire needs of those struggling during this unprecedented time. Let's pray fervently for the hundreds of thousands of freedom fighters in Ukraine and their families that God would repel the enemy and bring a peaceful end to this conflict. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see three easy, safe, and secure ways to donate. Or you can scan the QR code and follow the instructions. And if you're joining us for in-person services, you're welcome to drop off your donation in the bucket in a few moments as the ushers pass them or in the donation drop box right outside each theater. You're also welcome to use the giving kiosk located in the lobby. Would you bow your heads with me as I lead us in prayer? Lord in heaven, we lift up the people of Ukraine during this time of great distress and suffering. We admire their bravery and determination to defend their homeland and pray for their protection and safety. We believe that despite the onslaught of a formidable and well-equipped army, nothing can stand against an all-powerful and almighty God who stands for peace and freedom. We also pray for Russians impacted by this war and that you would empower four square churches in Russia, Ukraine, and throughout Europe to play a key role in providing relief to those hurting. Would you supernaturally intervene and bring a peaceful end to this conflict? In your mighty name we pray, amen. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you to New Hope Windward. We'd love to keep you informed and updated with all that's going on. You can go ahead and text NEW to 808-736-3777 and we'll mail you a New Hope Windward stainless steel insulated tumbler as a way of saying welcome. We'd love to stay connected with you this week. The easiest way to do that is by following us on social media. You're welcome to take out your phones right now and follow us on Facebook and Instagram or simply use the QR code on the screen. We'd also love to hear from you, and this is a great way to stay in touch with us. Today we have a great message, so would you join me in welcoming Pastor TJ. Today I, I want to share something with you that I probably would have never shared with you four months ago. And it's not that I didn't believe what I'm going to tell you today four months ago, it's just that God showed this to me in the last three months. 
You know, if you're new here today, let me just take a second to introduce myself. My name is TJ. I'm part of the teaching team here. And what I get the privilege of doing today is to share what we almost call like a one-off message, meaning next week we're going to start a, an entire series that we're excited for. But today, I get to share something that is just really fresh that I really feel like is going to bless you. Now, I also at this point just want to say hi to all of our campuses. Hey, all of you guys over at WCCC, at Suaro, at the Plaza and Ann Pearl. Listen, we love it that you join us every week. And when we prep and when we're doing this, we're thinking of you guys. And so I just want you to know that you're always in our hearts and always in our minds. And as I prepared this message today, I did so with you in mind. And what we're going to do today, uh, just to start out, is I want to start out by asking you a question that's going to function as, as an illustration. And here's what it is. Let's say that you had the opportunity to advise somebody that was just about to move to Hawaii, that was going to live in Hawaii. What is the most important piece of information that someone that, that needs to know that they're going to actually live here in Hawaii? Like, what would you tell them? So, Obviously, we'd answer this in two different ways. For those of us that are from Hawaii, we would probably say one thing. And if you're not from Hawaii, what would you think is the most important thing that people that are local here would tell you? Now, I, I ask this because for me, many of you know this, I'm not actually originally from here. Matter of fact, when I moved here, I looked quite a bit different. I'll show you just a couple pictures. Uh, this was me right when I got to Hawaii. And you can see it's kind of a grainy picture. You know why that is? Because when this picture was taken, we didn't have digital cameras yet. Yes, it was that long ago. And as you can see, had a little bit of this jerry curl action going on when I put gel in my hair. And if I just combed my hair naturally, this is what it looked like. No, that's not a wig. That is the only proof that I am a quarter popolo or quarter black. And when my hair went, so did the proof. And that's just how it is. Okay, so let's just picture now that you had a chance to sit down with me. And I was moving here, and I was going to live here. What is the one thing that you would tell me? What would you say if like, this is the most important thing? Would you tell me, hey, you know what you should do? You should learn to speak pigeon as fast as you can and then talk it nonstop. Or you should just wear Aloha shirts all day, every day. Now, if you're local to Hawaii, you're kind of rolling your eyes a little bit because that's what you shouldn't do when you move here. If you want to start on the wrong foot, go ahead and just... Do those two things and it will start to act as a disaster. But what would you tell me? If you had to boil it down to one thing. Well, for me, I've lived here now 19 years. Uh, I've lived here for a long time. This is longer than anywhere else I've lived. This place is home. I've been Hanaid, um, which means that the people that this is their island, this is their land. They've kind of taken me under their wings. And it's one of the greatest honors of my life. But one thing that I'll do is sometimes when people that are outsiders like me will move here, many times I will give them my biggest piece of information. Now, if you're online, why don't you just go ahead and throw in the chat what your piece of advice would be. And if you're anywhere else in a place, you can just say it out loud if you're watching one of our campuses. But while you do that, I'll, I'll give you what my piece is. And you might disagree with that, and that's totally fine. But this is what I'll tell people, basically. I'll, I'll tell them this. is say... You know, as you're coming into Hawaii, here's what I want to encourage you to do. I want you just to encourage you to just really learn how to just listen and just to learn and to observe um, the culture here because there is an entire different way of doing life here. And so if you can just listen, learn, and respect the culture, be willing to, to serve and to really um, come alongside, not trying to take anything from yourself, but just to help in any way in the community that you find yourself, you'll go a lot further than if you start off in any other way. And you may or may not agree with that. And if you disagree, I'd love to hear what you would say, because I'm always wanting to learn more and more and more. But for me, just to listen and to learn to respect, I think it's one of the biggest things on there. Now, the reason why I start out with this illustration is because in life, sometimes what we try to do is we try to distill things down to the, the, the most important thing. Like, what's the biggest thing that matters? Like, if somebody's about to get married, what's the one piece of advice that we would give to them? Or somebody that's about to become a parent, you know? And the reason we start here is because there's somebody who actually did this with Jesus. See, one guy, a guy, one time in the scriptures, a guy came up uh, and they basically asked Jesus, hey Jesus, what is it that matters most to God? What is it that is the most important thing? How can I inherit eternal life or God's greatest reward from his mindset? And he asked Jesus this question. 
Now, what is it that you think that Jesus responded with? Well, if you want to see, we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, picking it up in verse 25. I'll throw it up here on the screen. But this is what it says. It says that a lawyer came one day and stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, what you got to understand is the context here is that Jesus is surrounded by a bunch of people who are expert in God's law, or experts in the Old Testament, are people that were like the religious teachers of the day. And there's giant crowds. And they're coming to test him because Jesus has risen not just as a teacher, but he's performing miracles and he's got insight that no one else has. And so this lawyer comes and he, he asks him the question. Well, watch how Jesus responds. So Jesus said to him, well, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? I kind of love this response because what Jesus basically does is he takes the question he asks him and flips it on his head and asks the question back. You ever known anybody that does that? Like maybe you work with somebody that does that. You ask them a question and they, they kind of judo it and flip it around and ask you the same question. Or uh, maybe you're married to somebody, somebody like that. Or maybe you are somebody like that. But regardless, that's exactly what Jesus does here. And watch what this guy responds. He answered him and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus then says this to him. He says, you know what? You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, this thing that you said, that is the big one. That's the one to pay attention to. That's the one to really focus on. Now, if you go back to his answer, I, I want you to notice something. Do you see in his answer right here how it's all in caps lock? You see that? It's not a typo. Uh, it's not that he's screaming at them. I know on text message, anytime that people send me caps locks text messages, I feel like they're yelling. You know, it could be good yelling, angry yelling, but it's just loud and intense. But when you see this in the Bible, what it means is, is what they're doing is they're actually quoting the Old Testament. You'll see this in the New Testament. They're quoting scriptures in the past or they're quoting books that were written before. And in this essence, what he's basically doing is he's quoting Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4, or chapter 6, verse 4. Now, for some of you guys that are church people, you might read this scripture and you might have even answered this correctly yourself. Because for many of us that have been in church for six months or longer, we've heard this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And some of us might even be able to do it from memory. But what I'm going to show you today is that when Jesus is sharing this, or when Jesus affirms this with this guy, what you're going to find is he's actually affirming something that they were really familiar with, but he's going to take it now, and he's going to point out different elements in it. It's like a basic thing, and here's the reason why I wanted to teach this here today. See, for a lot of us, what happens, especially if you've been in church for a while, is many of us know God's Word here, but we don't always have it bleed through here. It gets stuck. And one of the things I want to show you today is what I believe helps it to get unstuck, and it's going to bring tremendous fruit inside of your life. Okay, so for the first thing here, does anybody know what this passage is called, Deuteronomy 6.4? Maybe those of you guys have been in church for 10 years or more. Do you know what you call this? I'll show you if you don't. What you call this is, they call this in Hebrew, the Shema. The Shema. And this is what it looks like in Hebrew. This is literally the passage in Deuteronomy 6.4. Now, for some of you guys, you're sitting here and uh, you might be reading it like this, trying to read it, trying to squint and get close and see that. But what you got to know is if you're reading Hebrew, because this is Hebrew, uh, you don't actually read like this. You actually read this way. And so what it says is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And uh, if you look at it in English, this is kind of what it looks like here. Hear, O Israel, this is the, the actual translation uh, when it comes to um, English, how we translate it today. And you'll see here, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You see this, this phrase and passage? That's the Shema that we see that, that's quoted. But what people don't realize is how regular, how normal this was for Hebrew boys. So what do you mean? See, Jewish people, they grew up praying this prayer, prayer, this passage right here, twice a day, every single day. Meaning at the morning, at nighttime, they would pray this. It was that important to them. And many times when they would pray, they, they'd pray in this fashion. They would actually, they would put their hand here because in Jewish thought, what they were basically pointing out is that, you know, um, 
this is the place from which they saw from. And this is the place that the scriptures were meant to be written on their mind and from their heart and their whole essence and being. And so they would pray this twice a day because they knew that this is the foundation they needed to live off of. This is how they needed to move forward. And what's crazy and what you got to understand is when Jesus points at this, he's pointing at the most familiar thing that they know. The Shema was everywhere. It was literally everything. By the way, do you know why they call it Shema? Anybody know the reason that's the word that they use? The reason they call it the word Shema is simply this. The word Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for Shema in English is here. That's what it means. Shema is the Hebrew word for the English word here. But the problem is, is that in Hebrew, it means a lot more than what it does in English. See, uh, in English, a lot of times we'll say one word and mean exactly that. So we, we mean hear, we'll, we'll use the word hear like this, like, um, hey, is that loud enough for you to hear? Or hey, did you hear what happened? Or hey, can you, can you hear that? And when we're saying the word hear, we're saying like, is there enough volume that it's actually able to go into your ear? Or has the sound come to your ear so that you can actually understand it? But if you are local to Hawaii, you have a leg up on everyone else today because in English, we speak in kind of like a literal, we one meaning for one word most of the time. But in Hawaiian and in Hebrew, a lot of times you can say one word and you can have multiple layers of meaning. In Hawaiian, they call that kauna. And in Hebrew, it's actually the same thing that's true. So when you see the word here, here, what they're actually talking about is this is not only can you hear it, but did you actually hear it? Did you understand it? Did you process it? And now are you actually doing it? Like, do you listen? Are you putting it into practice? This entire thing is actually what they mean when they say the word hear. You know, in my house, we have this kind of running joke. Um, my, uh, my wife, well, I'll say it like this. For me, I'm a serial multiprocessor. If any of you guys are out there, I've always got multi things going on in my mind, multitasking. I've always just got things running through. I just, I can't help it. It's just how I'm wired. But the other thing about me is that I have a, uh, like a, like a quasi photographic memory, semi photographic, meaning like when I hear information or when I read things, it just sticks. So for instance, that's one of the reasons why I preach without notes. It's not that I'm just like shooting from the hip. It's just that once I write it, I just, it's there. It's just in my mind. I can see it. And so sometimes I'll be at home and my wife will be sharing a bunch of stuff with me. I'll be sitting at the table and I'll get caught in this multitasking mode and she'll stop and she'll look at me and she'll say, hey, did you hear me? And at that moment, it's like I got the crosshairs on my head, you know, like I'm about to die. If I don't get this right, it is game over. And so what I'll do is I'll pause I'll take like three or five seconds and I will rewind the tape in my head. And then I will repeat to her the last like eight things that she told me word for word. And she'll look at me and she'll be like, okay, great, you heard me. Well, I mean, in the English sense, I heard her, but was I like listening and paying attention? I mean, I am now, right? That's the reality. I'm totally focused now. You get what I'm saying? Like I'm there, I'm with her. But the truth was is I heard her, but I didn't hear her. Can I tell you this? I think that for a lot of us, especially those of us that are Christians, we're kind of the same way. We hear his word, but we don't hear it. We don't put it into practice. We don't really allow it to do its work. And because of that, we're familiar with it, but it doesn't change us. And what I really want us to do today, what I really believe God's going to do is he's going to take a scripture that's so familiar and we're going to look at what does it mean to really hear it. And in doing so, you'll find it's actually going to change us. It's actually going to transform us in the way that we operate. And so the illustration I'm going to use to do this is off of a boat. Now, uh, the thing about me is I love boats. Uh, all the big stories in my life, they always involve a boat. For example, when I got married, uh, we couldn't necessarily afford to feed everybody at our wedding because we invited tons of people and weddings are expensive in Hawaii. So what I did um, is I have a friend locally here who took me on a boat. We went over to Molokai, a local guy, and we fished for food and we caught tons like I'll show you a couple pictures so this is one of the aluas that we caught out there and I mean we caught tons if you can see now so you know we ate all of these too we fed it to the whole wedding it was just awesome 
But one of the funny things to me is, although I love boats, it's like all my friends and family don't, the ones that are closest to me. Matter of fact, when they get on the boats, they get kind of just sick. Like I'll, I'll show you a couple pictures here. <laughs> These are my best friends. <laughs> this is on this trip. And sure enough, one after another, they started to get seasick because of just the balance on it. And they had to lay down on the deck. Now here's what you got to know. One guy that went with us on another trip like this, these trips that we take to do this kind of fishing, it's not short. It's not like two, three hours. It's like 36 hours. And one guy, one guy that went with us, he had to lay down within 30 minutes and he didn't get back up for 35 hours. I mean, he just laid, I mean, I just felt so bad for the guy, but it just, the boat wasn't balanced enough for him and it just threw him off. And so what I want to do is I want to use the Shema and talk about balance, kind of like a boat, because here's the thing about boats. They can flip in any direction. Is that not, is that not true? You can lean too far one way. My friend that paddles here locally um, and paddles canoes, they tells me like he had a race and it just leaned too far this way and the whole thing flipped. But it can also flip the other direction. And I think that when it comes to our heart and our love and when it comes to balance, many of us, without realizing it, we go too far off one side or the other. So here's my boat. So we think of a boat and we think of, okay, to stay balanced, I need to make sure I don't go too far this way and I don't go too far this way. But I want to round it out a little bit more here today. I also want to tell you this, is I think it's possible to go off too far this way and too far this way as well. And in order to stay balanced, what you've got to begin to do is not be somebody that just goes too far one direction. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use the Shema and the thing that Jesus talks about. And I'm going to transliterate into a Western way of thinking how we talk about it. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to translate it into some words that we would use as well. And maybe I'd say this, is we're to love Him with our mind or our intellect. Or we're to love Him in our emotions. Or we're to love Him in our ability just to be with Him, but also we're to love Him in our ability to do. And what Jesus is saying is what it really means to love with your whole being is not just to focus on one of these things, but to focus on all of these things. And that's what hit me so hard. See, what I'm gonna to suggest to you today is all of us are naturally wired to love in one way more than other ways. And Jesus is gonna say, what I want from you is not just part of your heart, I want the whole thing not just what you're naturally good at, but to really be balanced. See, for some of us, what it might look like is this, is to love the Lord your God with all your mind. It's when you get in the, the sermons or the message or the teaching, it's like your mind comes alive and you allow Him to change your thinking, you get challenged, you just love it. For others of you guys, it's not necessarily how it works for you. For you, you connect more in the emotions. And so for you, it's like when you're in worship time. It's like there's just... When the music's there and you're singing, it's like something inside of you, your whole essence in your being. It's like you're emoting, you're connecting to Him in your emotions. There's another of us, the way that we love is, it's just by being. We just love being still with Him. You just love to connect and just to pray. And there's others that just, they can't seem to sit still and they just, they're, they're doing and not in a bad way. They're constantly being part of, you know, different teams or ministries or ways to serve their neighbors. And when they're doing it, they come alive and they're not doing it for themselves. They're actually doing it because they genuinely love God and it's how they show their love. Now, none of these things are wrong. They're all great things. But what I really believe that for a lot of us, what we need is we actually need a balance there. Because for many of us, we just double down too far on one side. And in doing so, we actually miss the boat. Or let's say it another way, flip the boat. I'll show you one way. Let's say that you're real heavy on the, the intellect of the mind. And what can happen sometimes with people like this is oftentimes what we do is, is we'll quote scriptures if you're Christian and say, you know, like that we have the mind of Christ, which is true. And many times there'll be things that happen in our life that hits our heart, that hits our emotion. But we won't actually ever really acknowledge those things. We'll just keep it up in our mind. So we'll get really sad or something traumatic will have happened in our past or maybe just something just feels off and rather than acknowledging it and dealing with it, we'll just push it off and just say the joy of the Lord is my strength and we'll just try to mentally power through. Now some of you might say, well, what's wrong with that? It's like, well, nothing. Being able to mentally power through, that's a good quality, but... If you overdo it in this quality, what you realize is, is mentally power through doesn't always heal what's happening in here. 
And when we come to Jesus, He wants to heal all of our being. And sometimes the biggest step to actually experiencing healing is to admit that something's off in the beginning. You actually have to lean in now to the emotion side and not just power through with the intellect. I mean, if you were just with us for the series you did, remember we talked about the whole iceberg thing? You guys remember this? And what an iceberg looks like. And rather than just focusing on what we see looking at the top, there's this whole underneath in our emotions that we actually need to address what's really there. And sometimes if we're too focused on the mind and the intellect, we don't deal with this whole iceberg. And if that's you, I, I really want to encourage you to actually go watch the series you just did called Excessive, Badgery, Excessive Baggage. It was a game changer. We popped the hood, we looked underneath, and it brought freedom and healing. But it was a picture of, for many of us as Christians, what happens if we're all in our intellect and there's nothing in our heart and emotion. I shouldn't say nothing, but if we don't acknowledge that. Does that make sense? Now let's flip it on its head. What happens if you're somebody that's very much in touch with your emotions and feeling and connecting to God, but you aren't balancing it with loving the Lord your God with your mind? See, typically what happens here is it looks like this. When people start to do this, they, they, they will turn their affection towards God and they will just really love the parts of God that they choose to love. And what ends up happening is if they don't actually let God change the way that they think or they don't learn on that, what they end up loving is a version of God that seems an awful lot like themselves. Meaning this, he thinks like they think. He feels like they do about all the events in the world. He has nothing to say about their life that's any different than the choices that they would naturally make. And what people are doing without even realizing it is they are loving the image of God that they've created without understanding what he's actually like. See, the clearest picture of who God is is right here. Scripture. You're going to watch thousands of years in different writers. They're all pointing to the same exact being. God exists outside of opinions. If he really is who he says he is, it's, it's like my son Titan. He's an actual person. He's got a personality on that. And many people might have opinions. Oh, Titan's like this or Titan's like that. But the truth is, is Titan exists as his own person. And if you actually get to know him, you'll see what he really is. And it's not a matter of opinion. Does that make sense? See, a lot of times if we love the Lord our God too much in emotions, then what we'll end up doing is there's oftentimes our opinions will just line up with whatever it is that we feel. I could say it to you like this. Um, when was the last time that God rebuked you? Meaning this, when was the last time you felt him tell you something that you didn't want to hear or corrected you on something, a way that you were going, a way that you were thinking? They said, hey, that's not necessarily right. You need to do this. See, rebuke is actually one of the highest forms of love. It says that the Lord disciplines those that he loves. I've used this analogy, but it's the clearest one that I have. It's, it's my son, Titan, who I just told you about. He loves the ocean. He loves to play in salt water. We don't feed him a lot of like um, fried foods. And so he's developed this, this taste for salt. He loves salt. And he loves to lick the ocean water and drink a ton of it. Ton of it. Matter of fact, the first time he did it, he puked everywhere. He loves it. He genuinely in his heart, he loves it. Now imagine me as a dad, if I, I look at my son Titan and say, oh man, I'm so glad that you love that son. I'm so glad that's what makes your heart happy. You should just keep doing that. If I did that, you know what you should do? You should call CPS because drinking salt water is not a healthy thing. And the most loving thing I can do at that moment for Titan is not to look at him and be like, son, I'm so glad it makes your heart happy. It's son, this isn't healthy for you. It's destructive. And so I'll rebuke him. I'll tell him, in love, son, you can't do this. And I'll talk to him and teach him, and I will prevent him from doing that. Why? Because I'm mean or I'm cruel to him? No, because I actually love him, and he's thinking about this wrong. He's thinking in a way that he can't function in a healthy manner. See, many times what we need, maybe for you here today, it's not that your heart's not for God. It totally is. Your affections are towards him. But what you actually need today is to learn to love the Lord your God with your mind. You actually need to allow his word to speak into areas because the problems that you're dealing with, many times the word's going to address it directly. What's going on in your marriage and the attitudes, how you're handling your finances, the way that you use your time, how you think, anxiety. I mean, there's a ton of different things you can go through that if you will start to maybe allow the word of God to shape how you think and how you live, it'll change you. So it's not that you don't love God. You totally love God. 
But what you're just watching is an unbalanced love. And that's what I really feel like is like for many of us, we just, it's part of us, but God wants us to love him with all of us. Let's go to the other two, just to kind of balance this out. So the being and the doing. For some of us here, um, if you overdo it on the being and you don't do, what can happen sometimes is every time something goes wrong, you just kind of just retreat. It's like, I don't know what to do, so I'm just, I'm going to shut down and just go be with God. Now, nine times out of ten, that's a great move. But there are some times where you might feel distance from God or you might have something that, and what the Lord's prompting you to do is not necessarily just to step back into retreat, but actually to press in and actually do something. Uh, you know the feeding of the 5,000? It's a, a miracle um, that Jesus performed, and a lot of people don't realize when that happened. What had happened was is the, him and the disciples got some bad news, and they were on their way to just be, just be by themselves. And it said that the crowd ran after him. And when they landed on the shore, because they went on a boat, Jesus and his disciples, there was a ton of people there. And Jesus basically didn't want to send them away. He wanted his disciples to kick into action. In that moment, it wasn't time to be. It was actually time to do. He was going to give them time to be later. But there was a time where they weren't supposed to do this. They were actually supposed to shift into this. See, a lot of times what can happen for many of us is, is this is our strength being just really sitting and being with Jesus on that, then what we'll typically do is uh, many of us will even quote scriptures to reinforce it. We'll say things like, you know, like Mary and Martha story where Martha was busy and working and Mary sat at his feet and Jesus, when Martha said, hey, shouldn't Mary help me? And Jesus says, no, 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 she's chosen the one thing. And we'll see, that's why all we need to do is just be, is to be, is to be. Now, is that a like, misrepresentation of scripture? No, that is what Jesus is saying in that scripture. But there's other scriptures like the Great Commission that will tell us to go into all the world and to make disciples and actually to be and to be his hands and feet, or in other words, to do. Does that make sense? And if we unbalance it, then what you're going to find sometimes is for a lot of people, they don't fully experience the intimacy that they're meant to with God just by retreating. Matter of fact, a lot of times where our people will get to know God is when they actually meet Him on the playing field, when they actually start doing what it is that He wants to do, and they start reaching out to their neighbors and friends and family members, and there becomes this, this different level of knowing God where you're like partnering with Him. So again, what I'm saying in that is not necessarily just the being is bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying if we're unbalanced and all we do is be and it never leads to a healthy do, something's off. And maybe that's the case for you. Maybe at one point in your life, uh, talking to people that have been in church for a while, uh, you were really active in what God was doing. You were partnering with the local church and different outreaches. And you had a lot of things going on in there. And somewhere along the line, your life just got busy. And now for you, you just, you kind of just be with Jesus. And I do my own thing. And I feel like we're good, but you're not exactly participating in what he's doing in the world. And it might be breakthrough in this season for you looks like not necessarily stop being, that's not what I'm saying at all, but actually maybe to add some doing into the mix. And in doing so, you start to really see a different part of your life and your love come alive. Okay, let's flip in the last one. Some people here, it's the doing thing and they don't be and it's like they're busy. They're doing things for God because they love God and they're just jamming all the time. And what can happen is if you do that is if it's unbalanced, you can many times find yourself in a place where you almost just feel burnt out. I know, because that's my story. I'm naturally kind of someone in the mind side and someone that's in the doing side. And I found myself where I was just jamming all the time, doing all these different things, going, 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 going. And I would never really slow down just to be with Jesus. It's not because I didn't love him. I just didn't understand what it was like just to be with him to slow down and just take a full day to just, okay, God, what do you want to do sometimes? Or to just pray and go slow and ask him questions and just wait in silence. I loved him with my whole person. This side of the person just wasn't as developed. And that's what I want to tell you here today as we start to close this thing as this is, you know, for many of us, I feel like the breakthrough is going to come not necessarily by just relying on what you naturally are inclined to do, but by balancing it out with learning to love God from the other side. Learning to love God from the party that may not be as strong. And if you will allow him to do it, you'll experience a more fullness in your heart. 
more balance in there. For some of us in our mind, you don't just need another Bible study. You just need time sitting in worship with Him and learning to connect emotionally or even to process what's happening down here. It's going to change everything. Matter of fact, I'll do this. I'm just going to jam through a couple practicals for each one just so you have something to walk away with. Okay, so if you're more on the mind side, here's two suggestions. Maybe you prioritize being in worship this whole month. You know, sometimes if you're the mind, you'll think the message is the main event. So you might, if you're online, skip all the worship and just go for the word or you show up a little late to church because that's the main thing. But then what I want you to do this month is to come early and to get in the room where the worship and then I want you not to analyze the songs mentally. I want you to try to connect emotionally. Or maybe for you, what it would look like is rather than just talking through what you think, you start sharing what's actually going on in your heart in your small group. Hey, this is what I'm feeling and you're not trying to just excuse it away using your mind. Now, if you're on the other side, you're the emotions, here's what you might want to do. Maybe you'll pick one book in the Bible and you'll read straight through it. Read the whole thing. You don't have to do it in one day, but just read it from start to finish. Don't omit or skip any of it. If you're looking for a suggestion, um, read this. Read Luke, then read Acts. Those are actually one book, but they're two. It's, it's the New Testament. So read Luke and then read Acts. And what you're going to see is there's entire portions in there that maybe it's going to speak something to you that's going to challenge you. And if that happens, good, good. He's changing the way you think. He's realigning it. He's teaching you what's healthy and he'll move you towards life. Or another one you could do is to choose a reading plan for the Bible. They have a, a free app um, called the Bible app. You can get it on any phone and maybe just read for 15 minutes a day. Now, I do want to say this. When you pick one of these plans, make sure it's like you read through whole books because there's some plans that just like, oh, this is the joy plan. And it just tiny bits of scripture without the big picture. And what you're trying to do is to balance your mind and you need big chunks in there. So I would say just start with the life journal reading plan. Just start the life journal reading plan if you're looking for that. But either one of these, you can do that. Now, if you're somebody that's on the doing side, here's what I want you to do. Maybe this week, just take one hour, one full hour, and just walk with God. I mean, literally, just go walk with God. Go take a walk. Go in a place where your phone's off. You can't do anything else. You can't read. You can't write a list. Just slow down and just try to pray or ask Him questions. Or you could do this, take 15 minutes to just be with God five times this week. Do it in the morning, but same thing. No phone, no to-do list, no pen and paper. I don't want you doing, I just want you to just be. Because what we're trying to do is to learn to balance here. And lastly, if you're on the being side, this could be two things. Uh, you could volunteer in a ministry. Maybe for you, just find a place where you're not actively doing things or participating in this kingdom. And when you jump into a ministry, you jump into kids. It's amazing how when you're helping a kid, they'll ask you a question or something will happen. And it will literally like, it causes you to grow. I can't tell you how many of our kids workers, they're just like blown away by serving in kids, how much it changes and challenges them. And they find the heart of God in a way that just... They didn't grow that way before. I mean, that's just one example. There's a ton of others. Or maybe you could look for a practical way to love a neighbor or coworker this week. Someone that doesn't know God that you're going to do something tangible for. You know, you're going to, I'm going to make them something and take it over to their house. I'm going to find a way to, 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 to go out of your way and go extra, but just do it whatever the Lord prompts you. Just ask him, God, is there anything you want me to do? And just see what he says and then just do it. Okay. But Here's my whole point in coming to the end in this. I, I want you to close, and we're going to close by doing this. I just want to close by having you ask this question. Hey, God, is there an area of my heart that you want more of? It's just an area of my heart you want more of. And one of the habits I think that we need to get in is not necessarily listening to my words or Pastor Dave's words all the time, but actually just getting into a place where we directly connect to God and just ask a question. So as you saw the message I just communicated and what I just laid out, I just want you to pause and just to ask, hey God, is there an area of my life, an area of my heart that you want more of? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you about the next 20, 25 seconds just to, to sit and be still for a moment. Wherever you're at, uh, if you're washing dishes, if you're in the car, you can pull over, but just focus for a moment and just ask God this question. Is there any area of my heart that you want more of?
So if you felt like you have something, whatever it is, more than anything I said today, just put that into practice. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what he's after. They ask Jesus what matters most, it's that you give him your whole heart. And when you give him your whole heart, it's amazing what he gives us in return. And so I don't know about you, but for me, that's something that I've always known. It's not something that I've always lived. But I want to be one that doesn't just hear the word here, but I want to hear the word here. And I want to experience everything he has for me. But that only happens when we don't just hear the word, but we actually put it into practice. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer? Father, I thank you for your heart for us first. It says that we love you because you first loved us. And thank you that you love us. You love us with all of your being. You love us in a way you practically show. I mean, you loved us so much. It says that you even sent Jesus to die on a cross for us. That's how much you loved us. Your heart is always for us. As a matter of fact, I just even think that some of you might be watching this and you may be new or early in church and not even sure what God thinks towards you or how he feels about you. But I'll tell you this is that he loves you. It's as clear as day. That's what he, his heart is towards us. The question is, is what will our response be to him? Will we love him with our whole heart or will we be one that loves something else or has a split heart or only an unbalanced heart? And God is a, a church and part of the teaching team here. Uh, I want to come before you with everybody. And Lord, we just want to almost just repent and say, sorry, God, that we only sometimes love you with part of our heart or we only hear your word in one aspect and not the fullness of it. And God, we want to be a people who love you with our core of our being every fiber but only you can change that and do that and so this week God as we would go and we would um, take whatever step you spoke to us Holy Spirit we put one of these things into practice God help us to be wholeheartedly in love with you and to follow you with all of our heart all of our mind all of our soul and all of our strength we love you praise you and all God's people said Amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, thanks for joining us today. Next week, we're going to kick off this incredible series. Pastor Dave's going to be here. He's going to do it. It's going to be awesome. You won't want to miss it. But until then, we'll see you guys next week.